Okay, so we're, we're really at our, our last panel. I mean, David and I, after the last panel, will make a few brief concluding remarks, and thank you all. Uh, but uh, this last panel, uh, which is an hour and a half in length, um, is called The Future of Design Competitions. And it's, of course, building on what we've discussed today and building on the thoughts uh, that uh, the individual speakers uh, have. Each one of them will speak directly for five minutes up here, uh, and then we'll join them, David and I, and we'll have a discussion and then open it up to all of you as we've done uh, all day. So uh, the order is Sylvia Benedito, who's a professor here at the Graduate School of Design, followed by Stephen Cassell, who's a partner at uh, Architectural Research Office, ARO, uh, Grace Law, uh, who is a professor here uh, and runs the architecture program. Susanna Serefman, uh, who was founder of Dovetail Design Strategists, uh, one of the leading uh, architectural selection and design competition advisory firms uh, in the world. Um, and then we'll hear from two people who have already spoken uh, again as well, Marshall Brown, uh, who has been introduced, and Reed Kroloff, who's been w introduced. So let me call up Sylvia, please, uh, for five minutes each, and then we'll all array ourselves. Well, five minutes. I will try hard. Um, well, thanks for inviting me, Gerald, Vanell Institute. Um, it, it's great just being here to talk about uh, competitions, and I will be talking as an architect, an urbanist, a practitioner, and, and also as educator, um, and probably embodying a certain Eurocentric perspective on this topic. Um, I love and I hate competitions, as we all do, designers. Um, they feed our ambition, our kind of curiosity, commitment, and passion for design, and importantly, competitions provide a huge amount of adrenaline. <sighs> Great, we love it. Um, but however, this excitement doesn't last for, uh, forever, uh, because particularly uh, we have to pay bills. Um, so it's important to discuss on how we all can contribute and create better and more productive competition models and, and results, not only for the stakeholders, communities and investors, but also for the designers and in, in particular to, to the built environment. Um, the issues that I'll be talking uh, today, uh, kind of, they are a result of, of my critical position uh, after many competitions that I was involved while I was at uh, James Corner Field Operations in New York, uh, and while now I'm directing my own office based in Germany. Um, we, we, we participated in several competitions, some we won and, and others, others not. I think it's part of the business. So uh, my call, my, my five minute contribution here, I call it seven plus three, um, seven because I have seven points kind of manifesto points, and just three images. So very, very, very simple. Um, so I will start with my first point. Um, not yet. <laughs> I, I'm actually very glad that this, this is a, a topic about design competition and not design ideas competition. So one of my suggestions is to remove totally the word of ideas um, in the word of the title of design competition. Why? Um, because design is about ideas. Um, when wasn't design about ideas? We are so good in ideas. That's, we are, that's our profession. Um, we design, to design is to create, um, to imagine, and to overcome challenges. So we provide uh, ideas. Um, I'd like to use a comparison with Alvaro Siza that he, he, he kind of refuses to, word, to use the word social housing because by default, uh, housing is social. So design is about ideas. Uh, my second point uh, goes um, to that competition results as as good as their jurors. And here is a case of Sydney Opera. Um, as you may know, the winning competition by Jorn Jutzern was apparently rescued from the pile of discarded submissions by Eros Sarinen uh, when he joined later uh, the juror panel. So he was able to pick one of those and to select what we know is a wonderful building uh, in Sydney. I also believe that design is a language and it's, it has its own expertise and technical grammar and it has to be seriously understood, examined. And that's why as designers, we have been more and more engaged with community because it is hard to read plans, sections, and all the stuff, the drawings we create because they are technical pieces as well. So they are the regular instruments of our profession. Um, and this translation moment, to translate these design instruments into, into, into the community, this moment of translation is fundamental, and I think that we are truly needed um, in this process. 
um, as, as a note, and from my German experience, for instance, most of the German experience don't require renderings. Renderings are not allowed because they don't speak tru truthfully about, about, about the project. My third point is, is that the competition is a design service. When you do a competition, we are providing a service, and therefore compensation should be considered. This is a call for, for the profession to be rightfully acknowledged, our education, our expert, expertise, and I believe the professional association and other institutions should lead this endeavor. Um, and this is particularly relevant in the context of the financial burdens that our education entails. Wow. As many, as many of you know, knows that dark architects, uh, and particularly our students, they carry a lot of depths compared to other disciplines. The second point is that within this, this compensation is, is now there's a movement that we believe that uh, actually uh, interns should be paid properly because they are also providing services. So if we fight for that, we also have to fight for a certain compensation. The fourth point uh, is, leads me to another competition, minimum drawing requirement with maximum effects. As you might know, uh, Lucio Costa, this was his submission for the Brasilia, uh, for the new capital of Brazil, with minimal drawings. So how many drawings and stuff do we have to produce in order to convey ideas about design? That's a good precedent um, on this one. So I believe that requirements should be regulated. Fifth point, design to implement or design to raise questions, or both. Um, I think implementation is a fundamental aspect of design. Um, this is where design comes alive, where we literally change the built environment and we prove to society that we are needed. As a note, in most of European architectural schools require a built portfolio in order to be hired. Uh, we need built portfolios to showcase that we are valuable architects, that we prove our, the stuff that we project. That's why I believe the best outcomes of competitions are their implementations. Six uh, point, the role of the jury should be expanded. And I he uh, hear uh, what I'm, I'm kind of using a precedent is this competition called Aeropan uh, in Europe, in which the role of the jury is actually goes to implementation. They support, once they select the winners, they actually follow the implementation and they encourage the implementation. This is really important because they want to make sure that quality is, is guaranteed. Um, the third, the seventh point um, goes back to the competition brief should be a contract between the various entities. And wh while, while by, mean by contract, it mean, means that it's clear, clearly stated what, what are the, the outcomes of this competition because it also arms the designer to claim from certain things that we actually don't have any jurisdiction that helps us to actually claim to what was promised. So having said that, I support competitions. I'm really excited about competitions, but are, I think there's a minimum of things that should be regulated. Thank you. So I guess I'm, I'm so glad I went second because I learned how short five minutes is. Um, so uh, I, I started uh, my office with my partner, Adam Yurinsky, and I have another partner, Kim Yao, almost straight out of the GSD around 20. 21 years ago, I think. And I was trying to think, using this as an opportunity, like how many competitions have we done? Not a lot, actually. We're an office that we're sort of like a slow food uh, uh, movement. We're, we're not fast designers. We're sort of slow how we engage the, uh, the client, the site, all, all of that. So we're not actually prone to be a good competition. Thing. And I think that somewhere between 15 and 20, maybe in the last, uh, so less than one a year. Um, and I sort of use this as an opportunity to sort of think what is the criteria that we started to, to form in order to engage Engage that, and I actually sort of going back thinking about it. I thought about what's the most ridiculous competition we ever entered, and that was run by Reed Kroloff, <laughs> who's sitting in the front, <laughs> who's sitting in the uh, front uh, row. So in 2006, um, the History Channel sponsored a one-week design competition to look at the city of the future of New York. So you have a week, and if I remember, we were given the brief at 5:30 in the morning at, in Grand Central Station, and we were supposed to show up exactly seven days to the minute back in Grand Central Station to set up uh, uh, our thing in the Vanderbilt Hall against the other five, seven teams. I can't remember exactly. I remember some of the things. And so it's one of these things where we actually started building the model on day one before we had any idea 
of, of what we were doing. So it was just like, okay, you just have to move forward. But um, uh, it was an interesting thing, and we, we just decided very quickly we're going to look at something based on a 1850 or 18, what is it, 74 map of Manhattan, the VA map that looks at water uh, in Manhattan. And it started to become something dealing with water and, and really uh, climate change in an incredibly superficial way. It was a week. Um, uh, we ended up uh, uh, sort of shocking to us. We won the competition. They gave us this big check on a piece of foam core like this, which I think it might have got cleaned up in a big cleanup around two years ago in our office, but it may be behind a certain model on a top shelf. I sort of know where it is. We cashed it, by the way, that we kept the foam core. Um, uh, so we look at, there, there's this thing. We go forward. We did. We said, we said, yes, this is a fun thing. It was filmed. It became a little episode on the History Channel, City of the Future, which um, I didn't have cable. I never saw, actually. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, but then, then we went forward, and so I sort of traced the path of that competition to other projects that it led to within the office, and it was interesting. So, it led to down on the lower left um, us applying for a Latrobe Foundation grant um, with Guy Nordenson, who's a professor, a structural engineer professor at Princeton University, and a group of geophysicists. We did two-year study at climate change in the greater New York Harbor. That led to a book, which also led to um, uh, work on the rising currents, which we already talked about, uh, projects for New York Waterfront, which wasn't a competition, but in some ways was a similar format, which led to uh, post-Sandy um, uh, work uh, with the New York City's Office of Housing Recovery. I don't know if Thaddeus was in the audience before. He was our client with AECOM and Arup to map every typology of, of residents uh, building that was affected and how you needed to change that. So it actually led to a series of uh, serious investigation and it also led to us decide not to go after rebuild by design, which is another conversation. Um, so really the criteria that we decided is besides what is the goal of the competition on the exterior, is that goal right and is the competition the right tool for that? Uh, what we decided, and within this, is it's really an internal goal. So to us, a competition is an investment in intellectual capital for the office, not for the people outside of there. So in essence, these projects change the way our office thinks and approaches problems in a fundamental way on all the architecture that we do. So we always see this as an investment. You may give a project to someone and not get that, but that's a piece of paper. There are ideas embedded in there. Most of the people looking at it can get one-third, an eighth, or a sixteenth of those ideas. They still invest uh, or exist within the capital of our office and how we work. And so that's that. we see it as if we shift it that way, then we can decide, yes, it's worth engaging uh, a competition. So I was trying to ch sort of change how you look at the goal of competitions in, in the sort of architectural ecosystem. Hi. Um, I think I'll speak to you today uh, from the perspective of, um, I wear many different hats, but um, as, as, as predominantly someone who's, who's practiced law, Dahlman, uh, that was co-founded with my partner, James Dahlman, was actually started through competitions um, and uh, continues to do so. So it, this is a very meaningful topic to me. Um, as many of you uh, are aware, there are, um, two specific modes of representation that are ubiquitous in the realm of competition deliverables. The diagram and the 2D rendering. The hegemony of these specific representational artifacts persists unquestioned in their steadfast authority to describe the project. Both type of, types of artifacts are easily digestible and are thought to appropriately summarize the aspirations of an architectural design. Yet, as a designer uh, and a pedagogue, um, I calculated that I've reviewed more than 600 design projects um, to date in the course of more than 30 studios <laughs> that I've taught, but also within, of course, my own design work and in adjudic adjudicating for professional awards. I wonder to myself, what are the true representations of the design process, and what are the unknown or unimagined artifacts of the imaginary. And here, while the term imaginary is most commonly used as an adjective, 
uh, to describe something unreal or, or, or fictional, a fictional thing, for example, an imaginary thing. I draw specific attention to the imaginary in its noun form to refer to the repository of ideas and thought which underpins the human capacity to imagine the world. So architects are, of course, uh, trained in the making of the diagram. It is a very powerful tool, and therefore most architects have diagramming ready at their disposal as a means of quickly describing the essence and intentionality of their project. This is conceived as a shorthand language extolled for its concision and clarity. In the realm of competitions, however, it's often the case that the clearest diagram is often deemed to be the best design. And as if the clarity, uh, the, like just the, the, the notion of clarity, the quality of clarity, or disambiguity by itself, is an unimpeachable characteristic. Um, and this makes sense because the jury actually doesn't probably have the one month to review the Helsinki uh, Guggenheim entries which was calculated in that uh, earlier presentation. Uh, in fact, they were only gathered for a few days to, re to review the 1,400 or so projects. And yet we see it time and time again that we bemoan the subsequent physical outcome, the built diagram, whose virtue is unfortunately merely singular and thus impoverished in its capacity to address other issues less tangible, multivalent, sociological, political, and or temporal, yet equally, if not more important, for the quality of the city or the essence of the space. We yearn for the richly layered conditions which are intangible at times and actively resist reduction. So we're also aware that the 2D rendering captures a specific moment, moment in time, calcifying a fixed perspective. And we are aware of the power of seduction that these images hold, despite their tendency to be overworked, photoreal, overprocessed, and perhaps even disingenuous. The framing of views from impossible optical positions, the distortion and occlusion often necessary to compose the frame, the immaterial textures, the fudged perspectives. Strangely, space is often flattened, literally, and metaphorically in favor of the clever entourage or the commoditized objects of desire. The stuff in the images, clipped in Photoshop and sprinkled on the drawings. Like the architectural porn that we see in lifestyle magazines, the 2D rendering glamorizes our fixation on just how tasteful our stuff is, elevating stuff to be as important, if not more important, than space itself. So what are the deliverables, the unimagined artifacts, which not only describe the aspirations of a project, but may stimulate others? What are the other means of describing a design proposal that might be more illuminating and that unleash the potential of the imaginary? that render the action of the mind, the invisible, visible. So in practical terms, could such artifacts also demonstrate a more representative fit between designer and project, between client and designer? So I have three thoughts. Um, one, when, one which manipulates the accepted norm of the rendering, and two alternatives to the diagram. So if one accepts the notion that the 2D rendering is not to go away, what would happen if the requirements for the entourage were to be redefined? For example, what if designers were forbidden to use the hackneyed figures of pretty models, athletes and businessmen in helmet long suits? Uh, look at this woman. Um, I don't know what she's shielding her eyes from, but uh, she, she, uh, there's obviously some glare in the room. Oh, look, there she is again. Uh, she must be really <laughs> tired of that pose. Um, I am. I include my own work here to demonstrate that I am not immune to these familiar tropes. This is not my work, but there you have it, and here we are. Um, these are the tropes of the rendering. Yeah, and how about those birds? <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. Okay, hang on. Wait a minute. There we go. All right. Whoa, and this one. This one's as large as the building itself. So what if the entourage was, re was required, um, you know, what if the, 
if the entourage that we required would stimulate the imagination beyond the formal and the aesthetic territory and into the realm of ethics or of global issues such as poverty or climate uh, change. Sanda Eliskew of UVA spoke here just last week and she commented on this very subject. For example, the competition deliverables um, for a public space design would read entourage to include homeless people, the elderly, protesters, tired and pregnant women, the crippled, um, street cleaners, dead fish, tornadoes and lightning, and any other marginalized population or natural disaster that designers deems appropriate. So would this not stimulate the imagination between, beyond retail and recreation as primary protagonists for public space? No more stupid balloons, shopping queens, and ridiculous, meaningless flocks of birds. Perhaps rethinking entourage, the tropes of the rendering, um, would produce altogether um, different considerations. So another thought very quickly, what if the deliverables would include a cynic docic fragment, a part of the project which describes the whole? The power of the cynic docic fragment relies on its potential to establish an essential volumetric, qualitative, atmospheric, and material language for the project. It is also convertible in that the micro is capable of representing the macro and vice versa. Equally interesting is the possibility that the cynic docic fragment may refer to reversible pairings in which one thing is understood as the obverse of the other, disease to cure, energy to lethargy, heavy to light, density to openness. In this manner, we illuminate productive pressures in the projects, delineating those tensions as a representation of the project's situational aspirations, conflicts and complexities, and if possible, embedding the resolution of those tensions within the structural DNA of the project. So finally, a third thought. Perhaps the reductive diagram is replaced with pages from the designer's sketchbook, revealed as a compilation of thought and expression of the designer's mind. The sketchbook is inherently non-reductive. It is iterative, intimate, and recursive, bending inward upon itself, and unparalleled in its ability for revealing reflection. The sketchbook is deliberately inconclusive, indeterminate, open, investigatory, illuminating multiple agendas, and demonstrating awareness of conflicting tensions, encoded with tendencies, predilections, inquiry, and layers of meaning. Walter Benjamin in his article, Veil and Veilation, reminds us that everything which is beautiful, like revelation, contains historico-philosophical orders, for it does not render the notion visible, but its mystery. So the sketchbook, the cynic docic fragment, the redefined entourage, these are some examples of the true artifacts of the imaginary. And yet, they are hidden by the ubiquitous and unquestioned mandates for reductive, simplistic, and easily consumed deliverables. In order for, com for competition culture to evolve, we must search for ways to illuminate the mind of the designer, to reconceive the artifacts of the imaginary, and for juries who'd be able to discern the difference. Thank you. Hi, I'm Susanna Syrofman. Um, I'm trained as an architect, and I run Dovetail Design Strategists. We're a leading independent architect selection firm, and we have a broad range of clients. We do a, a, work in a broad range of sectors, and um, we do a whole range of competitive selection processes. And I wanted to talk today um, about one particular kind of, of, of competition. I think we've been talking about many, many different kinds of competitive selection processes today. And I wanted to, 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 to go back to the open architecture competition um, and the dearth of them in, uh, in, in the States. Um, being an architect myself, um, I'm a huge advocate for, for, for architects. And I do think that there is a significant place for um, open architecture competitions. And it's too bad that we don't have quite so many here. So architecture competitions do not exist in cultural or societal vacuums. Uh, the country within which an architecture competition takes place, be it a public or private venture, informs the rules, regulations, procedures, protocols, process, input, and outcome of that competition. And I think American architecture competitions, open competitions, well, all competitions actually, offer a mirror of contemporary American cultural, socioeconomic, political, and behavioral mores. 
Therefore, what I think is at the root um, of our lack of open competitions in this country is not our litigious nature. Um, there are plenty of lawsuits. You'd be surprised how many European lawsuits there are around design competitions. And it's also partly, but, but, but not completely, our lack of regulated process, uh, processes. I think um, that it is very much uh, the collective perception, or shall I say misperception, of architecture and design in this, in this country. Um, I'm not sure why, and I have no wish to America bash, but un unlike many other places in the world where design and designers are appreciated, our collective culture in the States, and there are many, many exceptions, but our collective culture in the States considers architecture and design as an add-on, something that's not absolutely necessary. Um, I obviously believe the opposite. I believe that, that, that architecture should be approached in just the, the opposite fashion. That's why I do what I do. And that when talking about the built environment, architecture and design is really the umbrella that everything else must fall, fall under. And that's my, my silly slide here represents the opposite sort of umbrella that I'm using as a metaphor for, for architecture and design, a sort of site-specific umbrella there. Um, but architecture is too often misunderstood. I think it's really seen as highbrow, it's perceived as a luxury, something that one can potentially do without, that will cost too much money, and so on. And as we all know, it really is just the opposite. It's about reaching potentials, creating accessibility, functionality, molding positive futures while saving money in the long run. And there's no doubt, um, frequently, this is when you get to do a, a, an open design competition, um, is when, when, when our people understand design as good business. And that's not the whole picture, but it gets us partially there. Um, so there's no other profession that suffers such misperceptions here in the States. Um, for example, if you have a legal problem, you go to a lawyer. You have a medical problem, you go to a doctor. You usually try and go to a specialist in that field. But you want to build a house, you don't always go to an architect. You might go to a builder or a contractor instead. Completely false economy, and you can see the results that you get. Um, so it's this, it's this lack of understanding of the profession and how important ideas, innovation, and experimentation with the, within the field should be that has led to this dearth of, of open competitions here in the States. And I have to say, architects do not help themselves. There was a bizarre series of op-ed pieces in the New York Times last summer. I don't know if you all saw it. But it was calling for less arrogance and more collaboration in architecture. Um, it was bashing star architects as though they were responsible for all the industry's woes. And in fact, I think in many ways um, there are pros and cons, but star architects really do advance the field in some ways. They're also nothing new. Go back to Mimar Sinan, Bruno Leski, Christopher Wren, Warren and Wetmore. In many ways, star architects and open competitions with exciting new buildings, or even not so exciting but new buildings, uh, pave the way for the public to see what is possible and what can be. And these are two, two, two you know, fabulous projects that were actually won through competitions. So, I mean, not to be too harsh, but there's really no other field I can think of that so publicly displays sour grapes. Um, you know, you don't see supporting actors and actresses bashing the stars in their films. In fact, it's quite the contrary. Those are the, that are super successful are held up as exemplars, mentors, and role models. So, you know, my message here was that architects should really need to celebrate American architects, celebrate the success of others, and should be proud to own their ideas. Uh, that's really their currency, and this needs to be celebrated, not denigrated. Um, and, so, and moving on, can, I think that competitions of any sort can be a way to celebrate that active invention, um, and a way for architects to show that they own their ideas. I think that the competition process, and certainly the open competition process, is a way of searching for that exciting act of invention. So one way of thinking about this is comparing the architecture competition process to the process of making a building, because uh, they're both very different. So the, pro the, the competition process itself has very different goals than the goals of making a building. So in the broadest possible terms, and this is huge oversimplification, but in the broadest possible terms, the elements of making a building can be boiled down to four major components, site, program, resources, and design. Site and program are usually established givens in an American architecture competition, but not always. Competition sponsors may sometimes be looking for fresh program ideas. Other sponsors might have a notion of the building program, but have not determined the site yet. Budget may also be provided in a competition brief, but again, not always. Consistently, the main element that is always absent, intentionally left out, is the building's design, the architect's act of invention. It is this act of invention, architecture or design, that encompasses all three other elements of making a building. It's holistic. 
Um, and in, I think in order for open competition to become more prevalent in the states and more useful for clients today, I think that architects need to reclaim their professional equity in relation to the other building ingredients, such as site, resources, and program. I think the architect's active invention is driven by site, resources, and program, but really does encompass all of these. And I think it's architect's responsibility to try and make everyone else understand. It's not, they're not the only ones responsible for it, but really to promote the understanding in the states that design is something holistic, um, which is where the rebuild by design uh, competition is so incredibly exciting, because you actually were asking designers and architects to come up with what the problem was. Um, but so there we are. There we go. Okay, I'm going to make up for everyone else's uh, overtime. We've been asked to answer the question of how to make uh, competitions better, but as you can probably guess, I prefer not to. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I prefer not to. Um, because competitions, I think, should not be considered ends in themselves. Um, that being said, I will try to um, give some very simple prescriptions on how we can make uh, maybe our lives a little bit um, better and how we can foster creativity in the field. I think we can only change competitions if we, the designers, change our own behavior individually and collectively. So whether that's in terms of the practice issues that have been brought up today or in terms of technique, um, like I think Grace so brilliantly showed. So uh, put more simply, if you're tired of the abuse, stop lining up for it. Um, number two, uh, I think that some of the questions about how to identify interesting new talent um, are actually easy to answer if we look outside our fields um, to some of our closest neighbors, not just, let's say, uh, engineering or high tech, but how about the art world? I've had a lot of engagements with the art world recently, and I think um, curatorial processes are very interesting and useful, and I would say in many ways the art world is far better than we are at identifying and supporting new and diverse talent. Um, you can go to any museum or gallery or contemporary uh, art museum and kind of see that. So um, I think looking, yes, at curatorial processes or in terms of uh, mentorship and support, you can look at programs like Creative Capital, which I think are brilliant. Um, and then another point, uh, this is kind of prescriptive advice to the Van Allen and other like-minded organizations. I would say um, if you want to support research and innovation, take the resources you're giving to staging competitions and instead create residencies, fellowships, more grants, and exhibitions. Just that simple. Um, and then finally, I'd like to address a uh, thing that uh, uh, the dean uh, brought up last night, which is the question of dreams, because I am also, more than anything else, actually interested in realizing uh, our collective dreams and my personal dreams as a, as a creative professional. Um, architecture is public work, but I'm not sure that always waiting for a client or a competition to define uh, or instigate the work is actually the best way or actually allows us to fulfill our potential as public intellectuals. So I think that the degree to which we can um, retrain ourselves um, to be, yes, more entrepreneurial, um, to, to free our dreams, for ent not entirely, but uh, some more from the constraints of, of, of others so that we come to the table more as equals, uh, we'll be doing a much better job uh, in realizing a much better uh, built environment in general. Thanks. Okay, last, and at five foot six, probably the least in a different express, different way of looking at that. Um, I just wanted to suggest five ways, rather than to make competitions more um, better, the five ways after running about 50 of them that my partner and I have begun to think about ways that least competitions can provide value or better value than they do. And that's to everybody engaged in them, not just to to the architects, and then I'm gonna show you a couple of pictures and show you what I mean. 
We think that competitions can provide value if one, they have clear, they have a clear end goal in mind before they're launched. Sort of like a faculty meeting when you're the dean, you know what you want to get accomplished. You need to bring the people along with you to get it done. When a competition has clear goals and folks who are running it know what they want out of the other end of it, you've got a much better chance of running a competition that people will do better in and that they will enjoy. Number two, you have to make sure the competitors are made aware of the competitive field and the intentions of the competition. The competitors need to know who's in the competition, what kind of people are in the competition, preferably everybody who's taking part, if you could do that. Occasionally you have to keep it private, but where you can, at least the scale of the competition and what it is that the competition sponsors expect or want out of the other end. Then the competitors at least are going in with a clear knowledge of what they're expected to do. Number three, competitions need to be well planned and they need to be well administered. Don't enter a competition run by idiots. And you can tell simply by looking at the materials that are available online. If they can't make a clear statement, if they can't explain to you in a few simple sentences what this competition is about, fold up your website and go somewhere else. Number four, the client and the competitors both must endorse and support the competition process. In other words, all in or none. Everybody has to be a part of the process and believe in it, or they really shouldn't be a part of it. No cynical sponsors, no cynical competitors. And finally, number five, the competition process must be transparent and it must be fair. In other words, it has to be ethical, and that's another way of saying that. It's gotta be transparent and fair. You've got to know all of the parts, and everybody has to be treated well all the way through. You would be surprised at how few competitions actually meet all five of those criteria. Shockingly few. Everyone by Van Allen, of course. <laughs> but other than that, it's not always so, well, I'm Susanna, I bet yours do as well. Um, but uh, the rest do not. And I, I can't help but think that, you know, uh, listening to Marshall and giving Marshall all his due, as I, have, uh, as I am wont to do, um, there are times when competitions are a good thing and yield good things. I'm going to try and forward a slide. Is it this mouse device? OK. This? OK. Oh, that guy. All right, thank you. No, try again. Okay, there we go. I think everybody recognizes this. Everyone from New York does. That's the High Line before they ran a competition. That was 10 minutes before Rudy Giuliani pulled the button to demolish this. And two young men managed to get him stopped. And the only way they stopped him and the evil cabal known as CSX Railway was to run an international design competition. And that competition served as a bulwark against the demolition process with proposals like this, turning the High Line into the world's longest two-lane swimming pool, which in the winter would become the world's longest two-lane skating rink and have a great butt cheek shot um, as part of the, this goes with the birds, but I'll take this over the birds any day of the week. And you can choose your sex, right? Yep, I think, I think Grace would like it as well. I actually know the guy that posed for this painting. Um, but this, the competition for the High Line was not actually to design, to create the design. It was to engender public support for the project. And it worked. And this is what we have as a result. Competitions can bring something good. And I would put it to you that the High Line is about as good as it gets. Thank you very much. Just say in the order, please. And you'll be there. That means here. Oh, that's you at the end? So this is me here? Yeah. Why don't you come on over here with the big kids here? Anywhere, guys. And then. So this is going to be the.
we're going to be short, 15 minutes, and this is going to be possibly the most unwieldy session or the most quiet session ever. Uh, so let's see where we're getting. But I like that several people over the, um, uh, over the two days have been referring to the presentation materials, and perhaps that's a nice way into this conversation for a moment. Coming out of uh, butt cheeks and, uh, and Grace's uh, very uh, careful drawings. Um, actually, at, um, at the Guggenheim a few years back, I got so tired of looking at museum projects that always had the Louise Bourgeois spider in it. <laughs> um, and I said, if I see one more of those spiders, I'm not going to vote oh, even for this project uh, on a jury process. So perhaps to keep the energy going and uh, heading towards the end of the afternoon, what do you not want to see in a, in a drawing or a rendering? And let's just whoop, go down the line. Uh, Reads already, we, we know. <laughs> I think I would, I don't know, okay. I think I would like <clears throat> to kind of continue the, the point that Grace was, was um, suggesting. And, and, and quick point, sir. <laughs> is I would like just to see the bare bones of the design, the structure, the tough stuff. No renderings, period. Well, that's a tough one, because from the client side, they want to see renderings. Um, In but, Germany, not. But, but that, which is very, very interesting. Um, but I, I, I think it's much more effective. It actually really shows the, the, the user groups that really will be using it, rather than a whole bunch of sexy people in their own tour. I was actually um, appalled to learn that, uh, that uh, the Helsinki, Helsinki project required a 3D, a 3D print uh, file, because of course you know that that's going to be about this big, and that will perpetuate the object orientation of the building. And that is, that is exactly what we do not need. Yeah, I think um, renderings are, uh, digital renderings to be specific, are a big problem throughout the design field, not just in competitions. There was a time before digital renderings when uh, there was a much tighter relationship between the kind of ideology of a project and the representational techniques, and that has been flattened quite a bit. More renderings and better renderings, absolutely. Sorry, Gerald and I got totally confused there in the middle of all of this. Do you want to say that or do you want? Okay. Well, the reason why I w wanted to listen to this uh, to this lineup is it all has a big impact on uh, on the jury process. So, and I had to think of that with with Grace's uh, statement earlier on. If you're going for a very very simple drawing, I also think it requires a very expert jury. That's right. That's, yeah. that's yeah. right. That's and, but then the question is, what is the expert jury that we're looking for in the future? Um, because I have a feeling that may not always be an expert jury that can actually read those drawings immediately. And I wonder if, but, how you... But wait, before you get yeah. to that, you know, um, if there's a really powerful big idea, um, even if it's not rendered in the sexiest way, it comes across. Think of myelin. Have you seen the competition drawings for it was that? Very simple. They're unbelievably simple, like shockingly simple. But it's this big, powerful idea. So I think that, you know, no matter the makeup of the jury, they, they got that. Yeah, but that's not fair. That's just very, very, very simple program. It's a well, monument. Right. Monuments are categories unto themselves that can com communicate in one line if they need to be, as that one was. And right. you're that's, absolutely right. That, that, that's fair but enough. more complicated projects need more complicated. Well, we had right. Brasilia right. as an right. example. Super simple drawings. And it, and, won. And, it, and, it but, and it illustrates nothing to anyone who's not an artist. But you're, you're also so, speaking to see, so we, we've got a process. conundrum here, or, or a challenge, or a dilemma, really, which is we there are you know Grace is criticizing images that lie. They're legible to the general public, but they lie. They present something that's not really going to be there. On the other hand, images that are legible only to experts are inaccessible to the public. And indeed, if we want to use competitions in part to bring in the public as a scaffolding for public participation and engagement, and we've heard about some wonderful competitions today that do exactly that, then we do have to have a graphic vocabulary, a text vocabulary, a presentation vocabulary that will be able to engage engage the public meaningfully in the competition, developing the brief all the way to the end of choice. Which so can, that's a challenge. Right. Which goes back to my comment over there. It depends on the intention of the competition, right? But it, when it also, we ran the Highline competition, we made very, very sure that the presentations were, were intended to be accessible to the public because we knew they would be hanging in Grand Central Station for two weeks, and that was the intention of the competition. But to do Brasilia, maybe? You know, if another architect or Aero Saarinen choosing that, that thing, um, that's a whole different animal. Right. But I'd like to hear Grace on yeah. this, because Grace, yeah. I think, put I this think, really um, on the table. I think that, um, so if the, goal, if, the, if the goal is to actually uh, to find talent, 
then, for example, I mean, I can look at my students right now. I have 70 of them. I can look at them, and if I look for two pages in their sketchbook, I can smell the talent. I know exactly who, who has the chops and who does not. We'll let you know so tomorrow, it's, by the so way. So it's, oh. a, it's, a, it's extremely legible. Now, I know that, okay, my expertise might be very particular, and I, and I can see something else that maybe somebody else can't see, so it, maybe it's not, it, maybe it's uh, inaccessible to the public, and I understand that, that if that's the process. But if, if the competition goal is to find talent, then these deliverables don't always deliver that. And in fact, the deliverables award other kinds of things, and then post facto we say, oh my God, that building one, and look how it's just a built diagram, and it's just a, so simplistic and so reduction doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. Well, you got what you paid for. You're, you're going to jury in two minutes, and you're going to get you're going to get something that is legible and accessible at the level of diagram. It's going to have to be very digestible, reductionist, and then you will have ultimately what you paid for. But we're conflating to one type of jury. And I think what we learned on the earlier projects, and I think the 11th Street is a very good example yes, of yes. that, and Rebuild by Design and others, are if there's one point of interface or an oversimplified point of interface to understand the design, then things have to be oversimplified in order to get it. If you have a multiple stage for, uh, process where people really whether it's the public or the client, really get to interrogate the designers and have a back and forth and understand that and then see how it moves forward in the next stage of the competition, that's a much more sophisticated process that is much closer to the traditional delivery process that we know. And so it's really one type where you have 20 things in a row, they're blind, you're looking at it, or a quick presentation. That's the, every, we're all talking about one type of uh, uh, competition judging. And I think maybe that's what we should be criticizing as opposed to, uh, uh, as opposed to just the vehicle that we're using for that. Stephen, I was going to ask you, can you say uh, in, in one minute uh, or, or less something about changing course? Because that actually does have an interesting jury process. So, uh, it's not a real jury. So uh, changing course is a, a project Van Allen is doing with Environmental Defense Fund. It is a six-month uh, design competition uh, with three teams of probably over 30 multidisciplinary teams looking at a very difficult engineering and social problem at the Lower Mississippi River Delta. And it is multiple stakeholders, but multiple meetings with feedback throughout this long period of time to A, look for innovation, but also look for depth of ideas and depth of solutions. And it's just, it's a major investment though. There's a major investment by the teams. They're getting a lot of money. Uh, probably nowhere near enough, but it's a very different process and model. I, I, I guess I would, you know, as we're at the end of the day now, it seems to me, and this is a generalization, but I think it really does apply generally, in my view, increasingly. Design competitions really have to have a public interest component to them. I don't care whether they're privately run, there's a private for-profit sponsor, it's public, it doesn't really matter because the private, even the private for-profit sponsor is getting something that she or he is not really fully entitled to if they get the services of 500 or 1,000 people providing ideas. So they have to give something back to the public as well. So if that's true, going all the way to rebuild by design in the 11th Street Bridge Project, et cetera, then we have to construct design competitions in a way that can indeed engage the public interest, which often will involve engaging the public in some way. And I don't mean in some sort of cheap participatory way, which is equally reductio absurdum, you know, which we can, I mean, we've had you know, phony public participation as well. But I think that becomes an obligation of anybody sponsoring a design competition to keep in mind that part of it has to ultimately advance the public interest for the public as a whole as well as for the participants. And that's a different vocabulary of presentation in every single way, I think, and can reinvent and reinvigorate, but we need to rethink perhaps potentially the process. I think for me, one important question, and we're talking a lot about community and community engagement, what do we designate by community? Who is this community? Is it people that are directly related with that area, or is the city in general, or, or are the direct state? Uh, well, we, we always will have that problem, whether it's we're using the modality of a design competition or any other kind of intervention in a city. So it's, a, it's an issue to be sure, but it's an issue that is generalizable to every action intervention we take. Although we have to be careful, and this is something, again, because mostly I just care about good architecture and great design, but um, we have to be careful when we're kind of publicly talking about how we get public benefits and just cities, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
you know, when behind the scenes we're perpetuating, uh, you know, business practices that wind up, you know, eventually, right, creating all kinds of inequalities within our profession. In fact, not eventually, immediately. And we all know this to be true, right? We've all seen it, that the firms that tend to win competitions and do them a lot, and again, I'm speaking from the American perspective, tend to be some of the worst perpetrators of intern abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And then that becomes, uh, th that translates into barriers to entry into the, into the profession for underrepresented groups, et cetera. We all know this, right? So we're saying one thing about our kind of vision for the world, right, and public life and community and social justice, et cetera, et cetera. But then we're, we're doing that, right, on the backs of people. And that's a big problem. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there, um, and probably all the architects on the, on the panel know, but you cannot uh, submit for AIA prizes anymore if you have unpaid interns in your office. Is, is that correct? Okay, the, good. Yes. So that, I think, is, is cutting a lot of that um, uh, out already. That helps. Um, one, one but we probably reasons, need more of these things in place. One of the reasons that I was proposing the sketchbook is because it's also accumulated over a period of time. It's actually not maybe made for the competition. It's just part of your... Like, show me, what you're show me what you think, how you think, what do you think about. And so it wouldn't be something that would have to be manufactured for the purpose of the competition. It's actually, it's a kind of um, compilation, a repository of ideas. And I think that that's really an interesting way of, you know, if you were, again, if the goal is to search for talent, I mean, again. Not, so, not to be cynical, but of course, then everyone will be doing their sketchbook <laughs> of the night before, trying to put together yeah, a story. Yeah, you know what, though? You can tell. You can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It does, I mean, it's very obvious, even to the layperson. But, but even, a even body of thought for over, over a year is different than a night the before. The scale of the sketch, the, the human great. touch of the sketch, is great even to talk about the process to communities and to society. Again, I, I think design is, is a technical, there, there's a technical grammar to it. And yes, it's about expertise. It's about understanding this language. But when you go to community, what, what are the other types of representation and discourse and narrative that designers all, also have and carry? And that's a very important time for us to communicate ideas. A completely different question. One of the tricky things in uh, in competitions is that they often feed um, a, a very young group of, of designers to elevate them uh, for the first time, always a great moment, or a very established um, uh, group. And would there be any way that you see, like, okay, what can we do to really uh, make sure that the mid-career architects have a way to be seen in this whole system? It's like the middle class, right? <laughs> they always get, the poor get it and the rich get it, but the middle class is the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's what you're suggesting. <laughs> any solutions for that, guys? We can have special invited competitions for these types of architects and landscape <laughs> architects. I'm sorry, it is the end of the day. <laughs> well, we have one minute. Gerald, uh, what would you like to kick in? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm prepared actually to turn it over to the audience, if you are, because I know they've been very, very patient. And, uh, and we, we do want to hear from you, which if you're not uh, tired as well, uh, please uh, feel free to, uh, to raise your hands and uh, ask a question. James Dahlman, don't you have a question for Grace? <laughs> not that question. <laughs> I mean, I, w I, will, I will respond to, to Reed, um, you know, as a sort of response to that question is that, yes, I think the High Line is an amazing example, one of the best examples we have seen uh, in recent years, if not ever, of what you can get from a design competition. But, you know, when I was writing last year, I was thinking about the High Line, I was thinking about Park de Lavalette, and I was thinking about uh, Liebeskind's uh, uh, Berlin uh, Jewish Museum although I call them out later for Ground Zero. But that being said, uh, the, uh, what's interesting about all those characters uh, or all those projects, which we were all weaned on, which we all look at as examples, is that before the competition, right, they had been doing all this research okay. right, independently. James Corner writing Taking Measures Across the American Landscape. You know, uh, Shumi doing the Manhattan transcripts. Uh, Liebeskin doing his work that he was doing at Cranbrook. And, it, and what you see very clearly is it wasn't the competition that produced the innovation. They had been producing the innovation already, and the competition just became an opportunity right, to distill that. I would differ on the Highline only because that there were two Highline competitions. Right. And the one that mm. we ran first was the open competition that was not going to lead to a commission. Sure. So that was just ideas. And, and that brought nine, just about 900 
and, it, and, and again, we have to, you know, and it's, it's the problem of language, and, you know, that's why defining design competitions is a sort of fool's errand, ultimately. One, by the way, that I pursued at the beginning of the day, because I think it's important, but I also think it's sort of ultimately ridiculous, because we have so many different mechanisms, and traditional procurement is actually a competitive process, but it's not open at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are four or five people competing, so, you know, it's ultimately, at the end of the day, there's a lot of sort of duplication, a lot of stress in all of the systems that we, we have. But I think what I like about design competitions, to tell you the truth at the end of the day, is that they're here. I think they're here to stay. We're not going to be able to totally slay them, although Marshall may you know, help us in that regard. But we're finally not going to be able to. So why not try to make them really as, as ethical and as productive as, as we can actually make them? And I know even Marshall, I think, would not secretly, but, but at least he'd have ideas about that, even if he'd say, I, I really finally don't want to touch them. Um, I think <laughs> the Jen here up front is... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Well, oh, you, you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. This has been great. This is much better than I even uh, imagined the conversation was going to be today. So thank you all. Um, clearly, competitions are doing a lot of good things, and there are certainly cases of, uh, of abuse and misuse, really. So I think picking up where you just were, uh, Gerald, how can we you know, clean up practice, right? And, and let me be a little self-serving here. As a municipality, a public official, we've used competitions, I think, well, very respectfully. Um, you just, does everybody know who you are? Oh, forgive me. I'm John Dills. I'm with the Boston Redevelopment Authority. We're right in the middle of Boston living with water which is sort of big ideas competition. But we've also used competitions for things like our, our energy positive green buildings, which was actually a fancy way of doing land disposition and development. But very much also about changing practice within the community, elevating small practitioners, bringing new people into the workspace, but also getting at the bigger conversation we are having a little bit earlier about how we uh, I'm going to try and do this without using innovation, but how do we propel change? How do we bring new ideas to the table? How do we uh, create moments for collaboration that haven't previously existed? So I see a great value in this, but clearly there's some cleanup needed. And so, Gerald, you were just about to get into that. How do we make this practice better? How could, how could I be a better practitioner in this space? Right. Well, I, I think we've addressed, you know, during the day and even last night, lots of the different things. They start with broad principles. I mean, I think, again, this due process, fairness, uh, dignity, uh, ethics, all, all of that is, is one piece of it. Everybody has to, to sort of get something out of it. Um, and uh, it goes on from there. It really, it seems to me, starts and finishes there. I mean, the, the other pieces of it, uh, you know, are dependent on the context in which you operate. Um, I mean, you can do a big public participation process without having a competition. I think that the challenge of the day is to guarantee that everybody who participates in this feels valorized. I don't mean financially, but I mean valorized. And that's the struggle that we all have. I mean, Elaine Lipstadt, as I said, you know, writes eloquently about, you know, just entering the competition is a victory, is a win. Well, if everybody feels that, then we don't have a problem. I don't think everybody <laughs> finally does feel that. So we, we need to think through. We also, I mean, I find it ironic, I was going to say this to, to uh, in the previous panel, you know, that we're going to use competition to solicit collaboration. I mean, it's a funny kind of irony uh, about that. But I think it's interesting. It's just, at the end of the day, the one thing that we haven't fully explored is what's the value of people competing against each other, literally? What does that do? And we're all sucked into the belief that that produces better work, more creative work, more productivity. It's sort of like human beings, when they compete, produce something better. All right, do we believe that or not? Is that the, the human species? And uh, that's a big question. We've got a whole sort of economy that's based on that, by the way. Um, do we argue about that? Do we believe that? I mean, we can build in labor fairness and other kinds of things in the socially progressive mixed market economy. But at the end of the day, is competition a good thing? I so, think it's a so, real question So on if, the table. if we believe that, then maybe we should stage competitions for the art world so we can get better paintings and better sculpture. It's called can, auctions. Can, but no, no, no. But can you imagine? Can you imagine MoMA? approaching Richard Serra, Kehende Wiley, and uh, Gerhard Richter and saying, look guys, we want to do an exhibition next year. 
but we want you to all uh, uh, compete for who's going to show. So make the paintings and sculptures. They would say to them politely, uh, go home. Public spaces. There's many calls for artwork for public spaces. Sure, sure. And and, and again, but I'm, I, I specifically name those uh, those people at the very, very top level. They would never submit to such an indignity. Not ever. Yet, in our field, the people who are at the very, very top level are doing this all the time. Not to be a downer, uh, but for the art world, I think it is very important who your gallery is when you want to get a big show going. And then um, this will really help um, in, in getting the show mounted because there's many more finances. So there's, such, there's an equally competitive system. It's just less visible, perhaps, to the outside world. And I, I mentioned it yesterday over dinner that I, I find that there's a charm to the design field. It is actually a very polite field and we, uh, we seem to care for each other. And the, the coming from the art world, I actually prefer um, uh, this setting uh, greatly. I mean, what's funny, I, it's funny you say that, you know, how polite and wonderful we are. Because, you know, at, on the other hand, uh, at, at our school and at every design school, what do we have? We've got reviews where students stand up in front of a jury and sometimes get sliced and diced by a jury. Judgment across the board and who's better. Grace actually knows who's better and worse. She's not going to list the students, but she can, she can spend a couple of minutes. Like It's sort of like the Guggenheim Helsinki. She can go through the sketchbooks and she'll tell you in this room who's going to be successful or not for the rest of their career. So this is, look, at the end of the day, we, the time. We, we all have judgment. and It doesn't mean we're right or wrong, but we have judgment about things that we deem better and worse. And, you know, we can say it's subjective, it's in the eye of the beholder, we can say objective metrics, but that's sort of the nature of how society is organized. And Jen, you had your microphone. So um, with the distinguished panel that we have, folks that have so much experience running these types of competitions, I wonder, uh, Marshall and I were having a side conversation for just a second before this panel started, kind of about where, where you think there's a pressing problem or a pressing opportunity kind of in this space where if attention were drawn and you were given sufficient creative boundaries to um, be able to elevate a particular problem to a level where it got the attention it deserved. We saw what the 1414 in the survey wanted or said where there might be opportunity in the area of hospitals and schools and you know, there's a list of six things. What are those for each of you that have been in this area for, um, for um, a while yourselves? Maybe I, I don't know if I will answer that question, but I'm going to make a parallel that is about with the uh, music industry. Because I believe this kind of self-promoting, trying to find our own projects and to publish, I think that's going to be our next step. That's what it happened with music industry. Think about that we had these contracts with labels. They didn't know, they, didn't, they were not able even to put our music outside, out there. And people started to record at home during their, like as an hobby and to self-promoting this music. And this destroyed basically the music industry as we know now. Can we imagine that in some years, we as entrepreneurs excited about the profession start to create our own competitions, our own projects and put it out there, publish it with books, Hulu, put it online, maybe, I don't know. I mean, By the way, I have one a question on this, Sylvia, if I could ask you. Uh, you know, one proposal that's on the table is to really get somebody to fund, you know, a, a library, a record, an inventory of every single design competition and all of the entries, this incredible body of knowledge that's been generated. And it's, it is fantastic. Anybody who has done research on competitions and looks on the web now at briefs and at entries, I mean, you learn just an incredible amount. You really can. I, I wonder, though, is everybody, I mean, do all designers love the idea that their idea is now online? Anybody can see it, by the way. It's like a syllabus, you know what I mean? Anybody can see it. Copy the course. Yes, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but I spent, you know, five years putting that thing together, and now somebody's teaching the same thing, or somebody takes it. It does have intellectual property issues, which we need to get into, and that's all important. It has been mentioned earlier. But I wonder, would that be something that everybody would 
endorse as, as competitors. You have already a precedent with this pool that is suggested by, I don't recall what is the group of designers that had this pool that they, they self-promoting it. Well, there's a group in Canada, Susanna's right, well, Canadian yeah. competition, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. I referenced yeah. this morning, yeah. has an yeah. enormous, starting in 2002. Right, but, but part of it is, is and part of the discussion and maybe the, the concern about competitions other than the uh, abuse part is an over oversimplification, at least in the architecture field, of when a design is delivered for a competition, it's not done. Mm. Our projects take two, three, four years, and there's a lot of work. So even if the idea is extant within that drawing, it doesn't become a good building or a great building or a, uh, an amazing building without this long gestation process of engaging the client, the contractor, or the financial, the community, all these other things. So again, this is one step the first step in a long process of choosing a team to go forward. So again, if we all focus, it's really the problem of focusing on the drawing or the diagram or et cetera. Again, that's step one of that's the easy part. The hard part is beyond that. But do, would there be interest in this kind of uh, inventory or record or library of all this material? I mean, first of all, I, I know consumers would be interested in it. I wonder if producers of the material would be happy to, to have that out there. I mean, Sylvia, you were talking about self-constructing, self-publishing. This is, you know, competitions to some degree can perform that role now in, in the sense that, you know, it, it could be a vehicle if there were a requirement that sponsors needed to maintain these things and deposit them somewhere in, in a central repository. I, I, think that's a, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I, I, one of the things, um, Kate, that Casey did uh, in the competition that I was in for the West End Bridge, um, which is Pittsburgh um, competition years ago, uh, he had he had um, gotten in touch with the Carnegie um, Art Museum, the Heinz Architectural Center, and after the West End Bridge competition ended, the finalists were actually exhibited there. To me, that that was I think James would agree that that was more important than any other aspect of that competition, that there was a, a place where all that thought energy would land in a disseminatable form um, for, for others, and that one could see, um, you know, then it was, and it was very public, you know, and, and so I think that would, I think that's a great and really important um, aspect of, of, because there's just so much, there's so much energy, and I think that's, that, that was the best thing about the competition. Whether you win or lose, it was that moment of exhibition. Actually, uh, I think James has a question. I don't know if I have a question. Um, I've been called out to make some comment, but <laughs> I'm, I'm, I think this is a fabulous conversation. One thing I find really interesting about it is that it starts to look for a way of relating within a design school the conditions that support designers, give them opportunity, which is partly what we're talking about, right? creating uh, capital for a practice, uh, how to build capital, how to create opportunity for practitioners to build their skill level, communicate with the world, and at the same time, to develop um, a designer's ability to, to uh, provide value for, the, for society. So to, to um, a competition can be a, a, just a venue to give the public a vision for what could be. And that somehow between those two realms, what what's, works for the designer, what gives them opportunity, and what uh, what provides value in society, is is what we're talking about. Um, I think it, personally, it was very interesting to hear Sylvia's comment about European competitions or in German in particular, because as a young practitioner, I was really interested in finding more opportunities and finding that returning to America after working in Europe for a little while there didn't seem to be any opportunities for young architects in the US to have a, a, a legitimate venue in competition mode that was, that was constant, that was re recurrent, that was typical for most projects. So you go to other venues, you go to RFPs, or you go to personal interaction, you go to um, finding a client by knocking on doors. And so I think it's interesting, it's a, it's a very cultural thing. So competitions in the mode of European competitions just haven't been cultivated in the US over time. So I'd just be interested to hear how you view this conversation, not just in the rarefied world of competitions, but in practice in general. How do architects, uh, designers, um, engage through many different forms of communication with the world? Yeah, you uh, know, since, since I retired from competitions, 
I've had to explore this uh, question directly, and uh, it's not that hard, right? Uh, someone told me once, and many of you probably heard this, just do good work and put it where people can see it. Um, so again, I've been talking about the art world because I have a lot of friends in the art world, and I've learned a lot from them because they don't do art competitions. Um, the, my friends in the art world, and they're not at the level of like Richard Serra yet, but they, th their opinion is that competitions are for bad artists, right? <laughs> or for artists who are not that good. Um, so, but they do have this whole other culture of studio visits, which are like a revelation to me. So like, you know, rarely a week goes by that I don't have a curator or some publisher coming over. And all you have to do for that is like buy chocolate and like sparkly water and some wine and you kind of <laughs> hang out or you make lunch. And you'd be surprised how door, quickly doors start to open, as long as the good work is there for them, them to see, for example. Um, you know, other things like doing, you know, writing. I have more time for writing now because I don't uh, participate in competitions. I have more time to apply for grants and search for those other things. So I think that the resources are there. Um, I think one of the things that we haven't talked about today, I haven't heard this word all day, is opportunity costs. That was, in the end, the, the reason I stepped away because I realized that the time, you know, the three months I spent working on Navy Pier, I was not doing other things. Like, how many other things could you do with that time, that money, that space, those materials? And it became kind of very strategic that there was a big opportunity cost, just all the other things I wasn't, wasn't doing. So I think it actually is not that hard once you actually open up that space to, to find other, other strategies. You know, if you look around this room, and not surprisingly, um, given where we are, um, most of the people talking today either are currently academics or were are recovering academics. Um, and uh, it looks like we're in the AA right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a different AA. Yeah, there's um, there um, the. The beauty of being in an academic setting is it gives you a different set of platforms off of which you can work. And one in this profession, one thing that that the profession can and should look to is its academic class taking it upon itself to provide leadership yes. in the dissemination of new information, new ways of thinking, new ways of, of, of and I'm not going to use the I word, but n new ways of changing the world. Um, and uh, it's, I think it's incumbent upon everybody except me now uh, in this room, to, and Susanna, um, to take that as a, a and you're a model, take, to take that as, an, uh, as a task. Um, we're going to wrap this up. It was great to have the six of you here to, to end the day with. Uh, so give these guys a, a good round of applause. <laughs>